Not that far. All right, there we go. Mother loves. Today we are continuing in our lesson on heaven and hell. What happens next? I will be discussing Genesis 1 through 3. No, we are not going to read all of Genesis 1 through 3. I hope you will do that on your own. I hope you already have done that on your own. Genesis chapters 1 through 3 are some of the most fascinating passages in the scriptures, personal favorites of mine. But we're talking about the gift of death today. When we talk about heaven and hell, it's important, well, one, that we realize that this is not the end of my sermon series on heaven and hell. There's six parts in this series. This is part two. If you happen to miss a part and you say, well, I'm confused, you can always go back and listen to them again. We are on Google, we are on Apple, we are on Amazon Podcasts, we are on YouTube, we are on our website, LaughlinChurch.com. Just go to Sermons, Past Sermons, we're right there. You can hear us again. So if you're away or you just want to re-listen, want to share it, it's all there. Um... But it's also important as we talk, think about heaven and hell, it's, it's important that we realize, I'm sorry, I almost forgot I had this on. I'm one of those weird people that actually like these things. Um, it's important that we realize that no one comes to the Bible in a vacuum. As we approach the Bible, we all have preconceived notions and ideas of what heaven is going to be like. Some of you are co comfortable with the notions that you currently have, and some of you are not so much. Last week, we, we talked about the misconception that heaven is just going to be, uh, you know, praise music all day long, which for some of you are like, yes. And then some people like me were like, pass. Um, But as we started talking about heaven last week, how many of you guys went home and started thinking about, where do I get my ideas of heaven? Yeah. A lot of us did. And the first answer is, well, the Bible, obviously, of course. But if we're honest with ourselves, we don't approach the Bible in a vacuum. There are things that affect how we read the scriptures, passages we pay attention to, passages we don't pay attention to. Um... Passages that we, you know, thought were in there that we aren't really in there. Your parents. How many of you guys get your attitude of heaven and hell from your parents? Or media in all its different forms. Books, radios, social, movies. Teachers. Priests or, or pastors. Traditions that have passed on. We don't come to, the, to our Bibles in a vacuum. You know, the book um, Dante's Divine Comedy, which some of you have read and some of you have not, but has influenced our view of heaven and hell for generations. And it has very little to do with the scriptures. But it's very influential on our views of heaven and hell. Our past religious ideologies or denominations. That influences how we view in hell. And so as we approach today and through the next weeks, we're going to try to look at the scriptures and just be honest with the scriptures. What does the scriptures really say? And some things that will come to your mind, we just won't have answers for. Like, are pet, your pets going to be in heaven? Well, the Bible just doesn't talk about it. So I have no idea. Let's hope so. But we don't know. Some things will come to un, you know, conclusions. You're like, well, I just don't care, right? Will we wear other colors than white? I like to think yes, because God created all these colors. But in the Bible, white's all they see him wearing, except Jesus. He wears red. But I like to think we wear other colors. But... 
but these things are trivial. They don't really matter. We're going to focus on some the bigger issues. So let's begin today with a word of prayer. Father God, we pray that as we look at your scriptures, as we approach your scriptures, Lord, I pray that we, we enter into with an open heart, an open mind, Lord, that we're just honest with the scriptures, Lord. I pray that, that we know we have preconceived notions, that, Lord, we pray that we deal with those honestly, that we just try to understand what you are saying, where you're, where you're saying them from. Lord, we pray that, um, that you lift us up And just give us the hope that heaven provides. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So when we talk about heaven, we talk about hell. Um, hold on. This is kind of the view that normally we the traditional view that kind of comes up in your minds. This is the view that I was taught under. The, um, when we talk about heaven, you know, we kind of have this view in our head that, that when our earthly life is over, there's this moment of uh, the, the password moment. Knock, knock, you know, what's the password? Um, and in that case, it's, it's have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? The Bible says if you've admitted that you need a Savior, believe in Him in your heart and confess with your mouth, then you will be saved. Saved from what? The punishment of your sin. And you'll get to go to heaven. And this is kind of the view that we have. There's this password moment, this moment where you die and either you go to heaven or hell. This is the way that I was raised. I don't know how many of you guys were raised that way, too. I imagine a lot of you were raised that way. Some of you are, there's a third box in there. That's, um, if you're Eastern Orthodox or Catholic, you might have the, the, um, the purgatory um, in there, that third place where you get to burn off your sins. Um, not in the scriptures, by the way. Um, it is in extra-biblical readings, uh, such as Dante's Inferno, where we get these ideas. Uh, but also other, uh, like um, the revelation of, of Levi and stuff like this that are extra biblical, that are not in the Bible, where we get these ideas. And, um, and so that's why I don't follow them, because they're not in the Bible. But, um, <coughs> and as we look at this, this is not a bad view. It is fairly true. It's just not a complete view of what the Bible actually says about heaven and hell. It's not complete. And so for the next five or six weeks, we are going to continue in with more trying to look at a more complete view of what heaven or hell is. The um, biblical view, and I'm going to admit I stole this image. It's not stealing if you tell you who did it, right? Dr. Tim Mackey is who I got this image from. He's the one who put it together. Um, and this um, this view of, of of heaven or hell is is more complete in line with the Bible. It's um, it begins before you. As we travel on through the ideas, the next few sermons are going to be all about traveling through this line of heaven and hell and. And what the Bible says. But life began before you. I think sometimes we as individuals um, sometimes tend to forget that. We get caught up in, 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 um, in ourselves. And we have to realize that life began before us. And to understand eternal life, heaven and hell, we must look before us. It's not just about your decision. And we must turn to the beginning. That's why we're going to start talking about heaven and hell right at the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapters 1 through 3. Now, hopefully you will read these on your own. Hopefully you already have. I want to turn uh, to Genesis 1, 26 through 28. 
Um, it says, and God said, let us make humankind. Some of your Bibles will say mankind. Uh, Adam in our image. And according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven. And over cattle and over the earth. And over every moving thing that moves upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of heaven. And over every animal that moves upon the earth. What an amazing image this is right here. This passage right here is amazing. God, the creator of all things, the creator of heaven and earth and and all of the universe says, I'm going to make for myself an image. I'm going to make a physical representation of who I am. And I'm going to do it and, and the word there, image, is the same word that will be later used in the scriptures to mean statue or idol. Because as man creates idols to represent God, we're not allowed to make one of God because he's already done it. He says, I am going to create my own image, my own living rep- physical representation of myself. It's human beings. In all their uniqueness, he created, it takes man and women to do it. It's not just like, oh, well, man, it's man and woman. He created them in the image of God. So they, in all the different cultures that we will be, that we are become and we will become in the future, all represent the image. It's amazing. It takes all of us to, to, to represent God. What an amazing thing. It's amazing that God... Both male, female, diversity. This is the image of God. And then Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 says, When Yahweh God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the, bl- the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And Yahweh God planted a garden in Eden, and the east, and there he put the man who he had formed. Humans are dust and divine breath. All living things, when you read the scripture, all living things that have breath of life, that are living, have the breath of life. That's, but only mankind did God breathe into his nostrils. There's a gift right there. So I'm going to breathe into my, my image, my breath. Not three separate things, you know, mind, body, and soul. We are soul. Human beings are soul. The Hebrew word is nephesh. It's the, the soul is, is um, the Greek, the view you probably have in your mind of soul is a Greek idea. That it can, your soul can be separated from the physical the nephish is, is all that makes you you. You are, a, that's the nephish. Um, and God planted them in the garden. And gardens are the interesting thing in the scriptures. This garden is, is a, a representation of God's space. He takes man, this dust, this image of him, and puts him in his space. And we're going to see the garden imagery and then it'll become a mountain imagery, and it becomes a city imagery, and then the Revelation has all, all three images in it of God's space being represented. This garden is represented God's space. My space, I'm going to take my place and put you in it. That space that I'm at. That where I may, ooh, this sounds familiar, that where I am, you may be as well. Didn't Jesus say something about that? Hmm, all the way back at the beginning, that's how it was. That where he was, we were also. Jesus wasn't just making stuff up. He was 
to return to the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And Yahweh took the man and set him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, From every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you shall eat from it, you shall surely die. This man, this image of God, who is the image of God, called to be kings and queens and rule and subdue and be God's co- He didn't have to do this, but he chose to choose mankind to help rule over the earth, govern it, take care of it. And we're given a choice, this, this, this tree choice, the tree of choices. And, and see, a lot of times we just think of one tree, but there's actually two trees that are in the center of the garden. One is the tree of life, and one of the others is the tree of this choice. Don't eat of it. And God had already said that all the creation was good. So it wasn't like this tree is bad. This is not an evil tree. It's probably a not yet tree. You know, like your cookie before dinner. Not yet. You're not ready yet. And he's given this choice. And so as they're in the center, they're given a choice. And, and this choice we can see in all of us because every day we're given a choice, right? Not every choice you have, any decision you make is a sin or not sin decision. You know, sometimes it's just what size coffee you want. But every day we have these choices in our lives. Sin, eat, don't sin, don't eat. Follow God's plan or say, I can rule on my own and make my own choices. They already were the image of God and, and, and the sense of, well, you want to be like God, but they already were like God. And the temptation was to be more like God. They didn't understand the likeness of God. They wanted us to subdue and say, I want to rule better than God. And so we're all given these choices. Do I want to rule differently outside of God's will? And sometimes we choose the right path. And sometimes we, not so good. We call that sin. When we choose not so good, we call that sin. And... Throughout the Bible, we see this motif, right? Choose right, choose life, trust and obey God in His plan brings life, brings good things. Follow a different plan, your own way, not so good. Though it may seem good to you at the moment, right? But instant gratification, whether it be in pleasure or... The dollar bill or the... It may seem good, but in the end, rebellion always leads to death. And so we have this image that's throughout the whole Bible. Trust God, life. Not death. And death is more than just a physical death. Death is, is a separation of what was never intended to be separated. When God says... I'm going to put you here in my space. We've got this tree that will let you live forever. There's this element that death is, is a separation. I'm not just talking about physical death. Uh, death is a, a separation of what was never supposed to be split. We have an emotional, um, uh, we have a racial, relational death in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Um, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed together fig leaves, and they were made for themselves coverings. They had this, you know, before, it's not just about being naked in a sexual sense. This is, they were open and, and, and free with each other, unashamed of each other, unashamed of being with each other. There was no secrets, nothing they were hide. They could be together and, 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 and not worry, and there's no judgment, and there's no... 
Now all of a sudden, they're not so sure about each other. They're not just naked physically, they're naked relationally and, 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 spirit, and, and socially and spiritually. And, and they, they realize that they're, there's no, nothing to, to guide against them, to, to guard themselves. And so they need these coverings to guard themselves. There's this relational death, this isolation and fear that comes from Seth. They isolate themselves. Not only they were open, they were together. Now they're covered and separate. There's another death. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Um, it says, And you, although you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the rulers of the authorities of the air and the spirit now work in the son of disobedience. There's this spiritual death element. Every time we sin, there's a spiritual death, a moral, spiritual separation from God, separation from the image. We are, we are less than the image that we're supposed to be. We were supposed to be the complete image of God that he'd made for ourselves, and we've made ourselves less of an image. That's why I say, you know, when people say, well, I'm only human, it's a lie. You're less than human. Because God made us his image, fully human. Now we're less than human. We're turning towards the beast. Because we're less than human. There's a, a separation from the image that was never supposed to be there. We were supposed to be in his space, close to him. Genesis chapter 3, verses, verse, verse 19. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For from it you were taken and you are dust and to dust you shall return. So not only is there a spiritual death, not only is there a relational death, there's also now has to be a physical death. That if we were supposed to stay in the Garden of Eden... In his space, where this tree of life was at, eating of the tree of life, we're never supposed to have this physical death. Physical death, a schism between the material and the immaterial develops. Now we have to have this place after we physically die. Go back to that image. Thank you. So sin of all types cause a separation from what we are designed to be. We were the image of God and sin entered in and death. We are created to be the image of God and when sin enters into the equation, there needs to be a physical death. Genesis chapter 3, 22 through 24. This is an amazing passage right here. And Yahweh God, so Yahweh Adonai, uh, said, Look, the man has come, become one of us to know good and evil. What if he stretches out his hand and takes also from the tree of life and eats for, and lives forever? And Yahweh God sent him from out from the Garden of Eden till the ground, to, to till the ground from which he was taken. So that he drove man out and placed a cherubim east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming, turning sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Look at this. We are no longer, because of sin, entered in. They were corrupt, broken, fallen. No longer a true reflection of God. And so he says, because of this death and separation, death Need, there needs to be a physical death. Death is a gift. What if they were to live forever, he says, in this fallen, corrupt state? What if? So in his grace, he says, I can't allow that. Because I want you to be more than what you've just become. So there has to be a physical death. We 
Because of God's mercy in our sin, and he gives us the gift of death. Now, most of us don't think of death in that way, do we? I mean, anyone who has lost anyone has a hard time thinking of death in this way, don't you? Because we miss them. We mourn them. We love them. Sometimes we wish we were with them. But sin causes a separation between the material and the immaterial, and we will die. But because of this, we also have future hope for the future. That we, know we do not have to be stuck in this corrupt, fallen, sometimes stupid, let's be honest with ourselves, state that we are now. We'll make dumb decisions like eating the third eclair which raises our blood pressures and our blood sugars. You know, God says, I'm not going to let you live that way. And, 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 and I'm not going to let you stay that way. So he gives us the death, this, this, this hope that I'm going to send you to a physical death so there's going to be an intermediate space. Until the new heaven and the new earth comes. And the new body. Where we can be the image of God. And as we... Um, we think of this, it's easy to say, well, that doesn't really affect me. But it does. It affects the very way we, we act, we think... Because of Jesus Christ. See, sin entered in through the image and destroyed the image. But then Jesus came. And Jesus came because, and when he died and rose from the grave, his righteousness placed on us, our sins on him. We accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Then we are restored into the position of image bearer of Christ. Rulers of king, kings and queens. Called to be in part of this kingdom. We are an image of God, even though you are still fallen that's why we, the process of justification, which we were made just, made right before God, go through the process of sanctification, which is where you will become more and more like him through life. And it's a journey you travel. Well, you know, a lot of times we want to make it a light switch, but it's a journey that you have to actually get up and walk. And we walk the journey where we become more and more like him, more and more like him, co-rulers of him, and we are re-imaged and re-created for the glory of God, created for the image that we're supposed to be. Until we're glorified. And that's glorification is the, when you, after you leave this earthly body and you get to experience a new body. You don't get to get it in this earth. Now, as I say that, I'm reminded of Paul's words. When he says to die is the gain, but to live is for the glory of God. If there's someone in this room who says, well, to die is the gain, I want to commit suicide. Thinking about taking it in their own home because they know that there's a better hope, that there's better something in the future, but they're unhappy right now because I know this world is hard. I know things are broken here. I know people have been hurt. I know that you have been hurt. I know that there are things in this life that don't seem fair. I know that there's challenges. And I know that we come to the place that some of us think about suicide. And there's help. There's hope 
there's help. If you need to reach out to someone, there's a hotline. The phone number's right after the, the service. If there's, you want to talk to us here, you want to talk to your neighbor right across the, 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 the aisle, we are here to help because we're stronger together. But the end is that when God will come get you when it's his time for you to go. Not when you think it's your time to go. And so Paul, he says, you know, it's to die is the gain. But for God's glory, I'm going to stay so that I may spread his glory. And while we're here for eternal, we are the image of God, which also means we have changed the lives. You know, sometimes we say, well, you know, we're all sinners, so therefore, you know, don't judge me which is true, but you judge yourself. If you are an image of God, are you acting like an image of God? If you are an image of God, does, is God reflected in you? I mean, many of us can say, well, yes. Well, there is that one spot. But God's okay with that. God might be forgiving, but he's called you to something more. It's not like he's going to kick you out of heaven for it, but he's called you to something more. He's called you to be his image here on earth. And so we have to look at we, you know, whatever that image, broken image may look like. You know, for some of it's gossip or greed or, or lust or, or um, you know, false religions or pornography or all these different things that we can get involved in that just do not reflect God. Are you reflecting the image of God? But as we talk about this, we realize that death is a gift, and it's never easy. As we think about people that have passed on, people we've lost, it's never easy. God, we, and we miss them, and we mourn, and we should mourn. Lamenting for people is healthy. You know, when we don't lament, that's actually unhealthy. Sorrow is a place where we're broken to be healed. That's why sometimes counselors make you go backwards so you can move forward because sometimes you have to, like, you have an old injury. You know, had a, a bone that didn't set right and let it grow. Doctors have to go in and re break it. Sometimes we have to do that with our emotions, too. God loves you and shows you his mercy. And part of that is death. So that we may have the hope. The hope that, 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 that God has already prepared a place for us and that those people who've passed on, they're there waiting for us. That there's a dwelling place. The Bible says there's a, a dwelling place. And I'm going to prepare one for you. What a blessing that is. And those people that were waiting for you, we have the hope of eternal life. We have the hope. Because we are creatures that are made for life eternal. And Jesus does say the only way to the heaven, the tr new heaven and new earth is through Jesus Christ. So if you've not accepted Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, now is the time to do it. Today is the time to do it. If you're struggling, I want to enter us into a time of invitation. This is a time in which we gather together. We invite you to come. We invite you to make choices. I'm going to pray. The choir is going to sing. But this is a time I invite you to lament if you need to lament. And if the altar is open, if you need to pray. I'm here. I'd love to pray over you. If you're struggling with suicide, fear and doubt, I pray that you do whatever it takes 
to get the help you need, whether it reach across the aisle, call a number, come see me, go see someone. If someone comes to you with these things, take them seriously. You don't have to be me. You can be you, but take people seriously. This time we invite you to say, well, I need help, or I need to, you know, that thing that's stopping me from being the image of God, here's what it is. I need to take some steps to stop whatever that image, image breaker is, that habitual sin. You know, a lot of times we fail to change our lives because we try to do it alone in a vacuum. You're not alone. Get help from the person next to you, the person around you. You're not alone. Father God, I pray right now that you will just bless us. The Lord, I pray that you give us the hope of heaven. We thank you for the gift of death that will we may pass away from this faulty life that we look forward to the hope of the new one. Lord, we thank you for giving us that space. Lord, I pray that if there's someone in this room that is thinking about suicide, that, Lord, you will get the help they need to them. But don't let them sit around waiting for it. Give them the strength to ask we don't know what's going on in people's hearts. You do. Lord, I pray that you bless the mothers in this room. The mothers that are our mothers physically or otherwise. And we pray for those mothers who have lost children and are lamenting. Lord, we worship you and we thank you. And we stand and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship him. If you need to come, please come.